Well, we have uh, somber things to talk about, but um, they're part of the teaching that needs to be done about open fellowship error that is dominant in the churches today. And uh, we're looking this evening at Ed Harrell and Homer Haley. I realize that both of these individuals have since passed on. And uh, so, you know, this is not really about personalities or uh, so much about these individuals, but it is nonetheless the case that they have been and remain influential in the churches, they have the sway and the control among the majority of the non-institutional churches, certainly in Texas. And so we ought to look at it, and I think that it's important for you to know, even if you don't know who these names are, you don't know who these people are, that is okay, as I say, they're, they're already gone, but I think it's important to know something about this because the fact is it set the precedent that remains in the churches today. Uh, the way that I would describe this is a great tragedy that happened in the 1980s when there was a great deal of controversy about a man who was well-loved and well-respected among the churches named Homer Haley who began very publicly to teach an error that actually he had been teaching and believing for many years prior to that. Our own Mark Powell is a witness to that because Homer Haley did a meeting at Kleinwood when Mark Powell was a kid and riding in the car with him and his father, who was an elder at the time, cross-examining him about this error that he taught. So many years before he taught that, he continued to teach it into the 80s. He continued to teach it until his death. Unrepentant, unashamed, unabashedly teaching error. But what happened that was really, and that's bad, but what's really bad is that Ed Harrell came after this <laughs> and showed everybody how to make compromise with this sin and showed everybody how to practice fellowship, despite the fact that this man is a known false teacher. And this is why we cite Revelation 2.14, where Balaam taught Balak how to place a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You may recall in ancient times that this false teacher, Balaam, who loved money more than anything, showed Balak the way to get God to curse the people. And Balak followed through with this in the incident of Baal Peor, which you can look up in your Bible later. But basically, they intermarried with them. He got the Moabites to marry with the Israelites and to cause them to worship false gods. And then God himself struck the Israelites for their sins. What Balak could not, or Balaam could not do by direct cursing and taking power over the people he, he still accomplished. He got his money out of Balak by showing Balak what to do next. He put the stumbling block before the people that caused them to fall. Well, all right. So this Homer Haley guy taught in his book, The Divorce and Remarried, Who Would Come to God, that people who are not Christians can marry and divorce all that they want. It doesn't matter until they become Christians. Once they become Christians, then of course they cannot divorce at will. They cannot remarry after having been divorced. All the things that Matthew 19 says. But before they're Christians, well, they're not subject to this, according to Homer Haley. The Bible notwithstanding. And there's a lot of, you know, difficult language about this, something about... The alien sinner is not amenable to the law of Christ. And whatever. Just people trying to feel better about themselves. Now, November 1988, sometime after the publication of that Homer Haley book, Ed Harrell began an article series in Christianity Magazine, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I tell you, it was very popular in the churches. Most people in the churches, the non-institutional churches, were affected by this. He began an article, Homer Haley, false teacher. 
because some were saying Homer Haley is a false teacher because he was teaching that divorced people could remarry, which is false. <laughs> and when you teach that for many years and have studied the matter with faithful men and persist in that teaching, you are a false teacher. There's no question that Homer Haley was a false teacher. But Ed Harrell, a different person, a Southern gentleman, argued that fellowship should continue with Homer Haley in spite of the fact that he was actively, unrepentantly teaching error. This is how it started in terms of our, uh, I guess, instruction, in terms of our uh, thinking about this uh, from a I guess from a didactic perspective, how are we going to follow this in history? These are the things that got written. So he starts, Ed Harrell does, with this article entitled Homer Haley, Was He a False Teacher or Not? In which he argues that no, he's not. And immediately after that one, there began a series of articles called The Bounds of Christian Unity, which is a more highfalutin language. Bounds of Christian unity means where are the boundaries? How do you draw lines over fellowship? That's what that means. And in that series of articles, he argues that Romans 14 provides the how-to instructions for setting the boundaries of fellowship. That Romans 14 is the way that we decide whether or not we can continue in fellowship despite doctrinal and moral differences. This is false, of course, but that's what he taught. And he taught this in some detail and at great length. Let's say this first article, Homer Haley, false teacher, is obviously the first article in the whole series. The series on fellowship follows immediately after that. But if you ask Christianity Magazine for it, they will not give you the first one, Homer Haley, False Teacher. That was an independent, unrelated article, supposedly. <laughs> Which is, of course, a lie. It's obviously the first one. That's the whole basis for this thing. But if you knew that what he was talking about was a man who believed that divorced people could remarry, then you wouldn't sit there and listen to his rambling and meandering through Romans 14 you would realize, hey man, ain't no way that could be right. That's not right. But that's too obvious. Satan would never do it that way. <laughs> Come on now. The other thing that I would remind you about Ed Harrell is that he is most known, even though in the churches he's well known and he's done many meetings here at Cedar Park and Northwest, all the other places, not at South Austin, never. But Sure, he's welcome just about anywhere that Jesse Jenkins makes it okay for him to go to. But the sectional origins of the Churches of Christ, sectional origins of the Churches of Christ, this is what Ed Harrell is actually best known for in the world, because he was a professor of history. And in this time of his professorship, in the Journal of Southern History, Volume 30, Number 3, he published a 17-page article called The Sectional Origins of the Churches of Christ. I just want to remind you that Ed Harrell is not even a Christian. If you read this book, or I'm sorry, if you read these 17 pages, which are available to you, members of South Austin, in our shared drive, um, it's something about American churches and Hughes, and it's a PDF in the main drive, in our shared drive. You have a copy that you can read. Um, he's not even a Christian because the sectional origins, again, is highfalutin language, but sectional means regional. This To him, this is about the Mason-Dixon line, north and south. Post-bellum, you know, following the Civil War, the cultural divide, that the Southerners went with Church of Christ and the Northerners went with Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. 
What are the origins of the churches of Christ? The origin, according to Ed Harrell, is it spun off of the Christian church. It coined this name in the 1910 census, I believe, or maybe it was 1900, but whatever. Coined the name Church of Christ in that census, separating itself from the northern cultural hegemony. Which, hey, I'm all for separating from the north, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Our barbecue is what you don't you don't want to believe what they call beef up there. I mean, come on. But truly, what does regional culture? All kidding aside, what does regional culture have to do with the church that belongs to Jesus Christ? Nothing. If you read the sectional origins of the churches, you will find things like the Christian church is the largest religion started in or native to North America. He believes the Church of Christ came from the Christian Church and that the Christian Church is a religious movement that started in North America. This is why I say to you, he's not even a Christian. He doesn't know that the Church started in 33 AD when Jesus inaugurated it in Acts chapter 2. When did Ed Harrell say this? Is this posthumously that we found it? No, it was 1964. He should never have set foot in a pulpit anywhere at any point in time. Everybody should have known this guy's not even a Christian. Why is he a preacher? Shouldn't have happened. So to give you an idea of the authority <laughs> behind the arguments that you will hear, this is what you're talking about. I bring this to your attention not to malign or attack the fella. He seemed like a nice fella. He seemed like a charming gentleman. Like you might enjoy a spot of tea or a round of golf with this fella. I don't see any reason to have a personal problem with the, with the guy. But I'm telling you, the works speak for themselves. The publications speak for themselves. This man did not know the truth. He did not teach the truth. And from everything we can read in his well-publicized, well-established, available today article in the Journal of Southern History, he's not even a Christian. Let alone a knowledgeable one who should be teaching. Well, let's answer Homer Haley first. Hey, take kind of a quick rundown here. Homer Haley's problem was he believed you didn't know the difference between right and wrong when you married and divorced all you wanted in the world and so you couldn't possibly be amenable to that all those things are in the past when you obey the gospel now you get to start over with a clean slate and even if you're divorced you can marry again but from now on you can't do it because now you're a christian that's homer haley's teaching okay and there's been all kinds of things i remember um I remember Tom Roberts had a wheel <laughs> styled after the Wheel of Fortune, but it was the Wheel of Fornication. <laughs> and he had all the different teachers on there. <laughs> and there are different errors. He's like, you spin it, and every time you end up with an unscriptural mate, no matter what you land on, you end up with an unscriptural mate. That was Tom. I love Tom. But anyway, the question remains, who is amenable to Christ? Who has to obey the teaching of Christ? That's the question. Well, in Mark 6, you find 17 and 18, this exact question, marriage and divorce. Herod, who is not a Jew, he's an, uh, of uh, Arabic descent. Herod sent and seized John the Baptist and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. Why did he do this? Because John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod is not a Jew. Herod is not a Christian. Herod, from what we can tell, doesn't even believe in God. But he had tied up John in prison because Herodias, his wife, was actually his brother Philip's wife. And this is recorded i mean this is well established in history as well his brother philip married herodias 
but she decided that Herod was better, and she went to him, and he married her. But she had no reason to leave Philip. And in God's eyes, Philip's wife is Herodias. She belongs to Philip, not to Herod. Even though Herod has married her, that's not relevant. The fact is she's still under oath to her original vows of marriage. And John had been saying exactly that. Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias is not your wife. That's your brother's wife. Yeah, well, but they divorced, and then I married her. Yeah, that doesn't matter to God. She made a vow, and she didn't keep it. You can't have, you can't have her. That's the teaching of Christ. So John the Baptist lost his head, literally, because of this. But somehow, brethren, want to make it okay. Somehow, brethren, want to make it no big deal. Something that can be reasoned away. Yeah, no. John didn't lose his life for nothing. He lost his life because this is the truth. And even Herod, who is not a Jew, who is not a Christian, is amenable to that. Well, that's fairly obvious, I think. In Matthew 19, haven't you read, He who created them from the beginning, verses 4 through 6, made them male and female. That answers other questions today. And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let nobody separate. No, God doesn't allow divorce. But for whom does he not allow divorce? Oh, those who were created from the beginning. Who's that? Oh, that's Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> are you descended from Adam and Eve? Yeah, me too. You know, what a coincidence. <laughs> we have a shared genealogy. You're descended from Adam and Eve too? Whoa, it's crazy. No, not really, right? Everybody who is descended from Adam and Eve is under the same law. When God said, that is why a man leaves father and mother, that's Genesis 3. That's right before they leave the garden or right before everything else starts, right? It's at the beginning of time. It has always been the rule for all of humanity. In Acts 17, when Paul preaches in Athens, Greece, there couldn't be people more ignorant of what God wanted than Athens, Greece. But he said to them in Acts 17, 30 to 32, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he is appointed. Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Again, there might have been times in the past that things were overlooked. It wasn't that they were right. It's that we had things that needed to happen in terms of the revelation of God. But... God now commands all people everywhere to repent. He has fixed a day. It's not something that's hovering out there that's dependent that has yet to be decided. It is a day that is fixed. And it is a day we are moving towards on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. The entire world will in righteousness. That is, it's going to be fair will be judged by the man Jesus. Who's amenable then to the law of Christ? Well, the entire world. And finally, in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, we are told that the Lord returns in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. It's just as clear as can be you know ignorance is not an excuse failure to obey god is not an excuse you are nonetheless amenable to christ and you're amenable to um, obeying the gospel if you don't know god you should have known god if you didn't obey the gospel you should have obeyed the gospel So who's amenable? Well, everybody. <laughs> everybody descended from Adam and Eve. 
everybody uh, who is going to be judged by Christ, everybody, even those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel, are subject to vengeance from God. So no, what Homer Haley taught was error, that is a lie. Practicing those things will cost you your soul. You won't be able to go to heaven that way. So that's the first thing, is we answer that problem. I think we should go on and look at some of the details in the article. I'd like to show you some quotations from the article so that we can pay close attention to what he's doing. And then we will close with the scriptures regarding this matter. Here's the first quotation for our consideration today. I do not believe that he is correct, says Ed Harrell about Homer Haley. I do not believe that he is correct. You say, oh, well, that sounds good. He said that Homer Haley was wrong. No, 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 no. That's not what he said. Slow down a little bit, friend. First of all, this is what Homer Haley, I'm sorry, this is what Ed Harrell thinks. Where's my pointer? Oh, man. Go back. Sorry. Hey, hey, hey. This is working. It is. Woohoo, I've got a laser pointer. Okay, so. It says, first of all, Notice what it does not say. It does not say the Bible teaches. Did you see that? It does not say these verses show. Right? What does it say? I. <laughs> okay, that's the first place where you went wrong. Second, I do not believe that he is correct. Oh, but this isn't about faith. This is. What is it? It's uncertainty. I'm not sure, but what I think about this, what I believe about this, is he's not correct. Right? That's the meaning here. This is not about faith. Oh, I don't have faith in him. Well, of course not. Nobody's arguing that. That's not what it means. He's saying here, as far as he can tell, this is not correct. Okay, that ain't the same thing as the Bible says, the verses show. Right, that's not the same thing. This is what I mean by he, te he taught the people how to do the wrong thing. You hear people talk just like this today. You bring up some problem. Well, you know, that's, I, I don't think that's what he meant by that. Oh, interesting. But what does the Bible say about that? Right now you're the bad guy. Because <laughs> you're asking for the verses. <laughs> I famously get in trouble, brethren, I'll tell you. I famously get in trouble for asking what verse is that. Um, and I, I'm not saying it to be rude or to be smart or funny. I, I do. I actually will ask, what verse is that? Because I want people to realize you need to have a book for what you're saying and, and you don't. All right, the next thing he says is, well, I don't believe that he's correct. Well, what does correct mean? <laughs> what verse is that? <laughs> now, there might be a translation that uses the word correct somewhere, but I don't remember it. What does this mean? Does that mean he teaches error? Does this mean he's a false teacher? No, it doesn't say any of that. Does this mean he misrepresents the Bible? He misrepresents himself? What does it mean? Well, this is the point. These are all, this whole thing is evasive. It sounds like he's against what Homer Haley teaches. But in point of fact, 
He can't tell you what Homer Haley teaches. He doesn't use the Bible as his authority for whether or not it's right. And he doesn't even tell you what is right and wrong. It's just correct, whatever that means. Well, in the context of a religious movement, which, home, which uh, Ed Harrell calls a wild democracy in the sectional origins. Yeah, that's what he said about the church. It's a wild democracy. Um, correct is just as good a word as any, isn't it? Because it's just politics. Next quote. If Brother Haley should write a summary of his views on this subject, I would regret that he might convert people to a view that I think is wrong. Sounds convincing, doesn't it? Oh, I would hate to see him summarize his views on this subject because some people's minds might be swayed. Right? And you're thinking, oh, their minds may swerve to error away from the truth. That's you being very nice, if not naive. <laughs> but that's you being very nice, giving the benefit of the doubt, trying to frame it in scriptural terms with which you are familiar. But that is not what he said. He said, number one, I, again, I would regret. Well, I don't really care what you regret. What does the Lord think about this? How do you know what the Lord thinks about this? Oh, you have to look at the Bible. Why don't you look at the Bible? That's the next question for you, isn't it? Why aren't they using the Bible? Hmm. I would regret. He might convert people. What do you mean regret? What does that mean? Oh, that's regrettable. Regrettable? Like the wrong color on your car? You know? What does that mean? He might convert people. <laughs> not that he would. Not that it has power of any kind of its own. It might convert people to a view. Is this a view? Or is it a teaching? Does the Bible talk about views? Peter gave his view on this subject, and Paul had a different view in Galatians 2. He didn't withstand him to his face. He presented an alternative viewpoint. You think? <clears throat> Wrong. No, but they always talk in these terms with the view. There's a view here. There's a different way of looking at this, an opinion, a uh, thought process. That I think is wrong. Again, I think, I believe, I would regret. These are all of them very spongy, amorphous, unclear. This is not uh, a definite line here. This is, well... I think it's wrong. You might think otherwise. He didn't say that, but he would. <laughs> and I've heard some of them do. The, some of the other editors I've heard. Uh, I heard Sewell Hall talk about it that way. He said, well, you know, not everybody will see it this way, but hear me out. I heard Sewell Hall say that. Like, well, no, Sewell, you know better than that. And again, we have this word wrong, which, like the word correct, is, well, unclear. Hmm. I seem to have lost control of my laser pointer. Oh well. <laughs> You'll just have to follow the highlighting. 
Next quote from the article, Homer Haley, false teacher. He says, it is perfectly proper that some congregations have not and would not invite Homer Haley to preach because of the position that he holds on this subject. Others, rightly, I believe, have decided to use him in spite of the difference. How magnanimous. Perfectly proper. Ooh, proper is almost a scriptural term. I wonder if he did that on purpose. Why are they not inviting him? They have not done so and they would not do so. First of all, why is inviting Homer Haley to hold a meeting a criterion? <laughs> why is this on the list of things that you need to do if you are a Church of Christ? <laughs> but then, for those that have chosen not to do so and will not do so, Ed Harrell says they've done it because of the position that he holds on this subject. Is that right? Is it a position? Remember earlier we saw a view that is wrong? Now we have a position that he holds on this subject. You mean the error that he teaches that causes men's souls to be lost? No, no, that's not what he means. You see? It sounds like that's what he means. That's clearly what he's referring to, but he will never call it error. He will never call Homer Haley a false teacher. He very clearly believes that Homer Haley is not a false teacher, although by every test, he is a false teacher. Others, rightly, I believe, have decided to use him in spite of the difference. So at least he's clear about what side he's on, if you will. He thinks that, well, yeah, you ought to use him in spite of the difference. Yeah, we have a difference in this matter, but, uh, you know, it's my belief, anyway, that the right thing to do is to use him. Again, why is he talking about, I believe, instead of the scriptures teach, the verses support, the Bible says? Why is that not there? I think you know why. Because the Bible doesn't say that. There might be a verse for it, though. Second Opinions 3.16. The next quote, I suspect that most people who invite Homer Haley to preach do so because they admire his life and have been enriched by his preaching, in spite of his views on divorce and remarriage. He is a great and a good man, and brethren have sought to use him and to honor him. At this late date, he deserves nothing less. <laughs> uh, may God forbid that anybody ever worship me like this. So, Homer Haley, false teacher. First of all, he said, I suspect. Once again, he never asserts anything clearly definitively, he never appeals to the authority of the Bible and the scripture to say this is right, this is truth, you must believe this because it's what the Bible says. He doesn't do that. He never does that. And that's what is missing in the pulpits in this city and its environments. They don't do that either. Again, most people, not everybody, can't account for everybody. It's just more gray, more spongy. That's all that this is, is padding. It makes it a very uh, difficult target. You can't really say that he said, this is why people do it. No, he suspects that most people probably do this. Why? Because they admire his life. I don't know what that means, frankly. What verse is that? <laughs> and have been enriched by his preaching. Is preaching's purpose to enrich a person? Or is it to 
reprove, rebuke, and exhort, say. For example, like what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4. In spite of his views on divorce and remarriage, and again, this is despite the fact that we admit there is a difference, and that the difference here, he, which is error, of course, about marriage and divorce, he calls it a view, a position. And again, he is a great and a good man. Well, says who? According to what standard? If you are a false teacher, if you are telling people things that cause them to be lost in the devil's hell, how are you a great and a good man? I mean, you might be a nice person who means well. But brethren have sought to use him and to honor him. That's very interesting that people seek this. They're eager, looking for this feather in the cap is what that is, isn't it? They want to have this person come out because it's a badge. It shows where they stand in the matter. It's their signal that they are open-minded, that they are intelligent, that they are flexible, like Ed Harrell is. That they wouldn't be arrogant and so bold as to say that they knew anything for sure from the scriptures. They want you to know that. They're humble. They're very proud of how humble they are. Use him and honor him. It's an amazing thing because what you see happen, you know, huh, how did they treat Tom Roberts? Right? How did they treat Dennis Scroggins? How did they treat the faithful while this man was teaching people things that lead them to hell? How did they treat their friends and their neighbors who needed Bible studies when they were spending hours and days studying with a man who should know better? Does this sound good to you? They sought to use him and to honor him? Ah, uh, no. No, this is not good at all. At this late date, he deserves nothing less. You know, he was Homer Haley was 85 when this article was written about him. So that's what he means. The guy's old. Give him a break. That's another thing that happens. And, you know, like we say so many times, what's the statute of limitations? Is it 85 and all bets are off? I remember one fella in the Bible walked with God. What was it? 300 years? Ah, yes. Yeah, 300 years. <laughs> Is that the cutoff? No, it's not actually. Does he really deserve? Do Christians deserve to be used and to be honored? And if so, why don't they use and honor faithful men? Hmm. Well, all this I say to bring to your attention. Oh, look, I got the pointer back, didn't I? But now I can't get out of this. And I don't know what's going on here. Sorry. Um, the fact is, uh, we have to understand these things. And I say them again, not to attack the man. I say to you, friends, the same arguments, the same language is used in the churches to this day. There are consequences to this. The reason, largely, why we have had to part ways with the other congregations in town is this. It comes from this method of practicing fellowship. This method of opening the doors to error and to false teachers. And Harold was not alone in defending Homer Haley. Uh, Jesse Jenkins also defended Homer Haley, saying he is not a false teacher. As did Dan Shipley, as did Jim Everett. Um, all of the, all of these men, George Slover. All of these men defended Homer Haley, that he is not a false teacher. He is a sincere man. He means well. He's a sincere man. 
And I remember well hearing Dan Shipley at Wansley Drive doing a meeting and uh, saying that that uh, Homer Haley taught falsely on this. And that he was, uh, you know, in error about marriage and divorce. And after that sermon in the lobby, if you remember once, some of you do, maybe, there's just one column that goes all the way, or one, uh, what is it, aisle, center aisle, there's a center aisle, thank you. It goes all the way back to the, to the foyer, right, where the exits are. <clears throat> And typically the preacher would go stand there and receive people as they're leaving. I went up to him and I said, I'm surprised to hear you say that Homer Haley is a false teacher. And he said in front of everybody, don't you ever say that about me. He did. <laughs> well, but you said he teaches. False. No, that that he teaches is false. He teaches that falsely. It's like, okay, but. Doesn't that make him a false teacher? He said, don't you tell anybody I said that. I did not say that. Okay. That's not what it sounds like you said, right? <laughs> I walked away at that point because it was clear he didn't, didn't want to hear it. Uh, but, you know, it sounds like that's what he said, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's what he wants you to think. He wants you to think that that's what he said. So that when Louis Samora tells you that, hey, Dan Shipley's off on this, they can tell you, well, no, I heard him. Mark Homer Haley is a false teacher. And I can tell them, no, you didn't. You better ask him, because I did. And he said, absolutely not, you're wrong. <laughs> you better ask again, friend. They did this, they have been doing this, it's been this way. The churches around here have been swallowed up with it. Robert Turner, no different. The last meeting that Tom Roberts did there at Oaks West, uh, he taught about this very topic, about Romans 14 error, and I was there. And Robert Turner got up after the lesson and said, we love Tom, we appreciate him, but we don't need that here. There you go. At least he was being plain in his talk at that point. So understand, friends, that it matters. This is a thing. I understand as well that most or all of these guys are dead. I think they're all, well, not all of them. Uh, Jesse and George are still around, but you get the idea. I understand that a lot of this is bygone and these people are not around anymore. I understand that. But the doctrine is definitely still around. The practice is definitely still around. The meetings continue, and the lack of meetings continues. <laughs> those that teach the truth, they're not going to those places. And the people they have at those places, we would never entertain here. So what does the Bible say about it? Ezekiel 18, 24 to 25, a righteous person turns away from righteousness and does injustice. When a righteous person turns and does exactly what the wicked person does, shall he live? No. None of the righteous deeds he has done will be remembered, for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin that he has committed, he will die. But you still say, the way of the Lord is not just. Here now, house of Israel, isn't my way, isn't my way that's not just? Isn't it your ways that are not just? Yeah, but the house of Israel is still doing this, you see. The churches are still doing it. The way that God wants us to handle fellowship and error is not the way the churches are doing it because they don't think God's way is just. They think their ways are just. Remember Jesus said, Matthew seven fifteen, Beware false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They look like sheep, but they're not. They're there to do harm, whether they realize it or not. I understand, you know, Jesse is camped on this one because Jesse Jenkins teaches, well, he was sincere. He's not a false teacher if he's sincere. And, uh, you know, sheep are there with the intent of eating, or I'm sorry, wolves are there with the intent of eating sheep. That is true. But I will argue wolves don't think it's wrong to eat sheep. Wolves think sheep are pretty tasty. And they are. 
That's what wolves do. So good intentions or not, the fact is when you're seeing the destruction of the sheep, you're seeing a wolf. Luke 6, 26, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Do you want to be treated the way that Homer Haley was treated? I do not. I don't think you should want that. And finally, 2 John 9 through 11, still there. Everyone who goes on ahead, that is, transgresses, crosses the line, and doesn't stay inside the boundaries, inside the confines of the teaching of Christ, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has father and son both. And if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting even. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. This is what the Bible says about fellowship. We can't pretend that everything is cool, that we all get along, we be brethren, and you know everything is great. Uh, we like this guy. He taught my, you know, Mima and Papa, and you know, that's got nothing to do with it, man. <laughs> that's got nothing to do with it. What verse is that? Where is the Bible? Why isn't God allowed to speak in His own assembly? It's crazy. Today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian for the salvation of your soul. I realize this lesson is maybe not the most obvious thing for somebody who's not a Christian, but I think you can make out the idea that it matters what you teach, it matters what you believe, it matters what you take hold of. That's what we're talking about when we speak about open fellowship. No, our fellowship is with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and that has to be pure. We're under obligation to know what we're taking hold of, what we're espousing, what we are putting a stamp of approval on. If you realize you overstepped those bounds with God and you need to repent, you, you stand in, in uh, uh, danger of the judgment, we will help you to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Are you a Christian today who has not lived right? Repent. Make things right with God in your prayer. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. But friends, I remind you, you've got to know these something about these names. I understand that a lot of them are, are gone, but listen, the, the teaching is still around. The impacts are still around. We got to where we are somehow, and this is how. So you got to know. And for that reason, I got to tell you. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. If today you need the prayers of the saints, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.